If you already have an optic with a reticle in there that you don't understand, uh, look up the app Strelock Pro, S-T-R-E-L-O-K, S-T-R-E-L-O-K Pro. I have no affiliation with this company, um, but it is a pretty cool little app. And what it will do, it has hundreds of reticles uh, library in there, and you can find, look in the box, find out what the reticle's called, look it up, and then you can put in your, your uh, you know, density altitude, barometric pressure, ballistic coefficient, all the stuff I'm going to teach you, and it will tell you exactly what that reticle means. So if it's a mill that reticle, you can turn it into a BDC reticle. It's actually a pretty cool little lap, but it'll give you an appreciation to how many different reticles are out there. There are so many. Now, um, so I've broken it down. I've broken it down to uh, five different types. Duplex, ballistic, mill dot, grid, and tremor. All right, I'm, I'm going to briefly describe each one so you understand what I'm talking about. So a duplex reticle, I know it's kind of ghetto, but I can't draw. A duplex reticle is kind of an old school reticle. Uh, it was used by the police departments a lot for uh, police snipers. Now, second focal plane, um, because it doesn't matter. I'm not shooting long distance. I get a really finite reticle in the middle here. I'm dialing everything, pushing the reticle down, elevating the gun to get back on target, and it, it fits the purposes of, of a police sniper or a hunting reticle, right? If I range a target at 200 yards, I dial my dope in minutes of angle or mills, I'm shooting crosshairs. So it doesn't matter if it's, front, if it's first focal plane, second focal plane, but these are second focal plane. I don't think I've ever seen a, a first focal plane. Now, it has a darker reticle here, 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 and here. Um, I mean, you could technically zero here, use this as a hole for 200 or whatever it is, and this for 400 for rapid engagement, but it's kind of ghetto, all right? Um, you could use this as a wind hold, and this is a wind hold, again, kind of ghetto. All right, but for a police sniper who uh, generally will move closer if he has wind, average police sniper engagement is 90 yards or something like that, crosshairs all day long. And that's what it was mainly used for. I've seen people turn up for a long range shooting class with these reticles. Don't buy this reticle, okay? Um, there's so many better options out there. Too old school. All right, so that's duplex. We move up to ballistic. Now, ballistic reticle is etched in the glass with range holes based on the bullet you're shooting. Now, if you look at this one, and this is only one example of probably hundreds, um, I would zero this here, and then this, is, this line is 300, 400, 500, 600 yards, right? This is kind of a typical BDC reticle. Um, BDC, bullet drop compensator, ballistic drop compensator. <laughs> so with this optic, I would zero it at 20, Actually, at zero to 50 yards, which gives me an alternate zero for, for 200 yards, which I'll, I'll talk about later on. And then if I go to a 400-yard target, I just hold 400. If I go to a 600-yard target, I just elevate the gun. Remember, we're elevating the gun to compensate for gravity. And I go to 600, I elevate the gun, put the six line on, and pull the trigger. The problem with BDC reticles um, are they're set for one bullet, one density altitude, and uh, one barometric pressure. Now, will they work at different altitudes, they will to a certain extent, but if they're set for sea level and I go to the mountains of Afghanistan with an ACOG and I shoot, um, it's going to not match up, all right? And again, it might be set for 55 grain bullet and I'm shooting 77 grain, not going to match up, all right? So what I can do and what we did in SOCOM is we found a kind of a happy spot um, I think it was 2,800 feet density altitude. That way, if I go to sea level, it's a couple of inches off. Go to 6,000 feet, it's a couple of inches off. And we found the bullet, the mid-range bullet, where if I go to 55 grand, it's a couple of inches off. It's within the noise of the rifle. All right, the good thing about BDC reticles is it's so simple to train and simple to shoot. The average infantry soldier does not know how to shoot in mills or minutes of angle. The average SF soldier does not know how to shoot in mills or minutes of angle unless he's sniper trained. Okay, so I can give it to a guy, I can do a little training with him, and I can bring him up and go, okay, that target's 400 meters, he holds the four line, breaks the shot, all right? Now these lines here, and they're not all like this, but generally, this is a ranging mechanism, right? If I have a target or a person, and I hold that reticle, and from here 
to here is generally 18 inches. If that three line matches perfectly, I just pull the trigger because that means he's at 300 yards. If the six line lines across his chest like that and he's straight on and I break the shot, I'm gonna hit him, okay? Um, because it's ballistically matched to the bullet I'm shooting and that's a ranging mechanism. It's hard to range targets, especially by eye. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of training. So that's a BDC reticle. There are tons of them out there, but the, the, the drawback is one density altitude, one bullet. So you've got to be uh, able to adjust it. Now, if you have a BDC reticle in your rifle and it's etched in the glass and built at the factory for sea level, and you're up in the mountains of Colorado, get on this uh, little app, Streelock Pro, find your reticle, put in all the atmospheric data, density, altitude, barometric pressure, humidity, all that stuff, and the, uh, the characteristics of your bullet, and it'll recalibrate this for you for where you are. So it might recalibrate and say, that first line is actually now 350, that second line is 475, based on where you are. So there is a mechanism to recalibrate that thing for you if it's not lining up, and you should be able to tell if it's lining up properly. Yes. Okay, so people always ask me where to zero a carbine, right? Especially with a, a BDC reticle. And I always ask, what's your application? And what does your reticle look like? All right, now, if your reticle is like, let's say your first number in your BDC is three, four, five, six. That's 300, 400, 500, 600. That means everything out to 200 is crosshairs. So I'm not gonna try to zero this thing at 200 yards. It's got six power and it, it's freaking that probably, that the bullet's not accurate enough to give me a good group and see where I'm hitting. But um, there's a little cheat, which is actually super cool. So when these guns are built, they're not, the, the bore and the optic are not parallel. If they were, they'd never cross, right? Because the bullet comes out, it starts dropping right away. The optic line goes straight and um, th th you'd never, they'd never cross, right? So the back of the rail or the back of the, the, the rail on the gun or the mount for the optic is jacked up slightly. It's called bias in the rail. And you'll see 20 minutes of angle. Um, you'll see 10 minutes of angle on some. And what that does is it raises the back of the optic slightly to get the line of the, the optic in line with the line of the bore. Now, it also allows you to zero higher in the optic and gives you more uh, of, the, of the reticle to use, okay, at longer ranges. Now, so because of that bias now, imagine the back of this is slightly canted up and so they're not parallel. Now, it's not something you would see, right? So what that does is, this is my high-speed drawing of an optic on my gun and because the, the optic is kind of canted up at the back, it's pointing down, the gun is kind of pointed up. When that bullet launches, it launches at a steeper angle. It flies and it drops, right? This is called rising branch. This is called max ord, and this is called falling branch. All right, not a big deal. We'll go through that later. So the optic looks straight, but the bullet flies at an angle. Now, because the bullet flies at an angle, it crosses the line of the optic in two spots. Now. If my first line on my BDC, or your BDC is three, I want my crosshairs to hit everything out to 200 yards. Then when I go to three, I elevate. I go to four, I elevate, and I'm compensating for that bullet drop, right? So what I do is I zero at 50 yards, and I get that a lot. People ask, where do you zero a, a carbine? So if I zero at 50 yards, ballistically, that is what's called a near zero, and the bullet rises and falls, perfectly at 200 yards, or within the noise of the rifle. It might be 210 or whatever, and you can find that out, right? Depending on the bullet. Now, um, that's called a near zero and a far zero, and it saves you trying to zero this low-powered variable optic at 200 yards and group the gun, group the rifle, right? So if your first line is three, zero at 50, and then everything out to 200 is crosshairs. Now, you're going to hit um, a little... Um, low at two, one and two, but it's, 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 it's inches, right? Um, and then, so your crosshairs out to two, and then you go to three, four, five. This is how you zero that low-powered variable optic, right? Now, 
if your first number here is four, five, six, seven hundred yards, then everything in that crosshair out to 300 yards, everything out to 300 crosshair. So in that situation, I would have my near zero at 25, which would give me a far zero or an alternate zero of 300, okay? It gives me a, a zero at 25, alternate zero at 300, everything out to 300 is crosshairs, then I elevate the gun more to compensate for the bullet drop at four, five, and six, and uh, it's money. Great way to zero uh, a carbine with a low-powered variable optic on it. Hope that makes sense. But if you're not sure where you should do it based on the bullet, pull up that app, Streelock Pro, and change your zero range. And change it from 25 to 50 to 35, and then look at 300, and if it shows that there's zero elevation at 300, then that's your, your um, alternate zero for 25, if that makes sense. Play about with it, it's a very educational tool. All right, so moving on, MILDOT. A MILDOT scopes are around very, very uh, prevalent. Um, sometimes you'll see just MILDOTs like this, and sometimes you'll see them have half mills here. Won't make a lot of sense unless you understand the relationship between minutes of angle and mils. We'll get into that. It's not as complicated as people make out. They're just units of measure that get bigger as we go, as we go out in distance, all right? We'll cover that in a little bit. But the mil dot scope's a very traditional scope. Like I said, that's what we rocked for years and years and years. And probably a lot of uh, militaries are probably still running mil dot scopes. Good for measuring targets, which we call milling which is a way to um, find the range of the target, which we'll cover. Um, you can dial or you can hold, all right? Now, um, the problem with dialing, all right, let's talk about that for a second. So this is a mechanical device. The more input you put into it, vis-a-vis -vis dialing, um, the more error you're building in. So we used to test scopes a lot. And it's actually not a bad idea. If you buy a high-end scope, do a tall target test. Now, rather than me going through the whole thing step by step, check out YouTube, look at Brian Litz, Applied Ballistics, and he explains the tall target test in detail. I'm gonna cover it real fast. So I go, I get my brand new optic, and I wanna see, sorry, <laughs> I wanna see if I dial 10 mils, is it actually pushing the reticle down 10 mils, or is it pushing it nine and a half, or is it pushing it 10.4, right? So, um, scopes have gotten better, and their tolerances have gotten better since we started testing for this, but like when you write a spec for an optic in SOCOM, it has to dial to within 0.1. And the, the, the one we just selected, the Night Force, was able to do that because we put it in the specifications. But there has been times in the past where I dial 10 mils and it goes up 9.7. That's 0.3 of a mil, which is a minute of angle, which is a 10 inch miss at 1,000 yards. That's unacceptable, okay? So the way you test this, so let's say I get on my gun, I get on my, uh, I have a good zero, and I put a pasty at 100 yards, right? And let's say when I zeroed, this is my zero, I put five rounds in that pasty, all right? Now, um, you need a tall target. That's why they call it the tall target test. So what I'll do is I know I have a good zero. Now I'm going to dial 10 mils on my elevation, which will push my reticle down 10 mils. All right, which will force me to elevate the rifle and I'll get back on this target and I'll shoot five more rounds. So I'm still aiming here, but my bullet should impact exactly 10 mils high. All right, and I can measure that with my reticle in my, in my scope or my reticle in my spot and scope. And sometimes you'll find, instead of being 10 mils, it's 10.3 or 9.7. That's a minute of angle, that's a minute of angle, and it's off because it's a mechanical device. And scope companies have been getting away with it for years. And then what we'll do is we'll dial 10 mils right. And we'll still aim here, and our bullets should then, uh, if I dial 10 mils right, I gotta go, it's actually, I dial 10 mils left, and my bullets should end up here. 
and that should be perfectly 10 mils. Okay, then I come down 10 mils, my point of aim is still here, and my five rounds is here, here, and then I come back the opposite way 10 mils, and I should stack five rounds back on where I originally went. If you do that, and it goes 10 mils perfect, 10 mils perfect, 10 mils perfect, 10 mils perfect, you're back where you are, you got a badass scope. Generally, that rarely, rarely, rarely happens, but it's a really good drill. If you've got the facilities, all you need is 100 yards and a tall target, do it in your backyard, and you'll find that very quickly, whether your scope tracks or not. Now, because of um, tactical operations and because of shooting at night and, and, and a lot of considerations, the, a lot of militaries, all special operations and the, the, the army, and I think the Marine Corps now, have gone to gridded reticles. So what gridded reticles do is they take all this mechanical stuff that can have error and they etch it into the glass. So instead of dialing 10 mils and elevating the gun, I'm etching the grid into the reticle, I'm elevating the reticle, and I never, ever, ever have to touch this unless there's certain times you would, but I, I generally don't have to touch elevation or windage now. It's great for rapid engagement at multiple targets at different ranges, and that's kind of combat shooting, right? So the first company that started with this was Horus. Horus started with the whole grid reticle model, and I think it started with the H27, then it went to the 37, then it went to the 58, then the 59, then the tremor, blah, blah, blah. So they've gotten better and better and better as they go. And I'm a huge fan of gridded reticle. It's pretty much all I shoot now. Now, when you look at a gridded reticle, um, you're gonna look at it and go, oh my God, that's too busy. I could never use that. You get to the point where, okay, I gotta hold four mils of elevation and two mils of wind. I only see the crosshair I need and everything else just blends in the background. It's great for milling. It's great for rapid engagement. It's great for movers. And there's some fantastic features in it. And it's not, I'm not gonna be able to, fully explain it on this crappy drawing, but I will get into it in much better detail um, once we get our graphics up and running. But I always, always, always encourage people to go with a gridded reticle, and I always encourage people to go to a tremor, um, a tremor three reticle. It's the SOCOM reticle of choice for all our, our long guns, and it's absolutely fantastic, right? So we covered duplex, ballistic, milvat, Gridded is something like this, not a great drawing, but instead of dialing, that's my crosshair for 100. And then my ballistic calculator tells me, okay, that shot is five mils of elevation. That's one, two, three, four, five. That's my hold. And then two mils of wind. That's my new crosshair. If I shoot at that target, let's say, let's say that's my target right there. And I shoot, bang, and I see in my reticle the, the bullet hits here. All I do is drag that spot back on a target and take a second shot correction because I've got a reference. If I try to do that here, my bullet hits here, I have no frame of reference to drag that back on. Okay, I've got to start dialing and moving things and inputting error. So gridded reticles are fantastic. All right, now, they evolved over the last 10 years. Like I said, it started with the, the 27, 37, and don't correct me if I'm wrong, man, I can't remember. I've been blown up a lot of times. Um, and then we went to the age 58, which is what the Army put in their 2010. And um, then we went to the age 59, which was slightly tweaked. Then we went to the Tremor 2, which um, was not as successful because when you have a spotter spotting and correcting in mills, and a shooter shooting in minutes of uh, in, in wind dots, it just didn't work that well. But then the Tremor 3 came out, which kind of blended the H59 and the Tremor 2, and it's a fantastic reticle. I got a crappy drawing of it right here, but I'm gonna show you a graphic. So with the Tremor, so the Tremor stands for the refined mill reticle, okay? Now, and there was a Tremor 2, so the Tremor 3, and there's a new, there's newer ones now, but the SOCOM programmer record for reticles is this, and here's why. So it gives you the best of a gridded reticle, like this, where I can do rapid shots and rapid engagement, I can shoot movers, I can mill things, I, I, it's very, very versatile, but it has wind dots built into the grid. So these are wind dots that are calibrated for the bullet you're shooting. 
and the muzzle loss that you're shooting from the gun you're using, right? So um, it's not ballistic specific. It's adaptable to any round you're shooting. And instead of doing, like, let's say I'm on a rooftop and I'm trying to take a shot at 800 meters and I got a 40 mile an hour wind, instead of trying to do math in my head and figure out what that hold is, if I know that each wind dot for this gun is five mile an hour, then I just hold four wind dots or three wind dots, bump it up a little bit and I take a shot, okay? The, the wind dots are calibrated for the bullet you're shooting and it saves you doing math. And I hate math and math is hard, right? And um, whoever said snipers are good at math, it's full of shit. Um, I hate math. So anything that makes my life easier and gets me a, a, a faster shot on target, I'm all for, okay? Now, the Trimmer 3 has other features which are um, that really, really good as well. I'm going to go into more detail on that. So I'm telling you now, if you're buying a gun, uh, if you're not in a hurry, wait till we get through the whole series because you'll be so much better educated. But if you just can't wait, buy a 6.5 Creedmoor, um, bolt gun or gas gun, there's pros and cons to each. Uh, put a decent optic on it, put a gridded reticle on it, and put a Tremor 3 reticle on it because you will thank me later on. Once you learn how to use it, it's fantastic. It's super intuitive. It's tunable for every bullet you have, and it makes your life so much easier, unless you like math. And um, if you do, good luck to you. You're a nerd. Okay, so um, I understand there's tons and tons and tons and tons of reticles out there. That's kind of general categories of each one. Um, and go with questions, because I will look at the comments after this, and I will try to answer some of the questions in the next segment. So the next segment, I'm going to go into terminology, because I don't want to be talking about bore height and bullet weight and ballistic coefficient, and have people like, what the hell is he talking about? So I'm going to go through step by step on terminology that you are going to hear me talk about. now. We can go down a rabbit hole on this stuff. I'm trying to give you what you need to get you started uh, without going into heavy, heavy, heavy rocket science that nobody cares about, okay? So that's the next segment. Uh, that's all I got. <laughs>